I'm Marnie Blair and I am a print media artist in Alberta. I would like to thank SNAP and the Alberta Printmakers for inviting me to speak about my practice with you today. First I would like to acknowledge that I'm presenting to you from Treaty 7, Treaty 6 and the Métis ancestral lands, the gathering place of many Indigenous people. Waskasu CP or the Elk River was uh, eventually translated by white settlers to Red Deer. This is an example of a 1927 uh, medical illustration in a textbook and we call it flap anatomy. So one, two, three, four, all five pieces lift and they have multiple layers underneath showing skin, muscles, bones, etc. So in my artistic practice, I prim primarily work in printmaking uh, with a focus on embodiment, medicine, and technology. My artwork is strongly informed by surviving cardiac arrest as a teenager. At the time, I was diagnosed with something called Long QT syndrome. It's a condition that affects the heart's electrical system not so much the heart, which uh, immediately led to the implantation of a cardiac defibrillator. Uh, and I'm on my fourth one now. The next uh, artwork I show you uh, actually has this uh, sound piece in it. Uh, this is the art of heart art oscillation, which is basically using a stethoscope to listen to the sounds inside of your body. This is a Canadian educational tool. It's a vinyl record for medical students and it was produced by G. W. Manning in 1970. And I'll just let you hear a little bit. Case 23, age 12, ventricular septal defect, left sternal border area. So, this piece is titled Rubitosis, and Rubitosis is the unsettling awareness of your own heartbeat. And for the past 20 years, I've been very aware of my heartbeat on a daily basis. Uh, so this piece is a laser-cut medical gown. Me uh, medical gown seams and uh, a medical cart uh, for like a surgery. Um, when you get up close to the laser cut heart it almost looks like camouflage netting um, and it has a little bit of a burnt smell to it. Um, uh, and in the cart uh, the audio plays from the vinyl record on a loop. This is a really early piece. Um, so my artworks are explorations of the intersections between fragility and resilience, the biological and the artificial, private and public, decay and resuscitation, and sometimes the body and architecture. I'm particularly interested in how one's sense of embodiment and identity become profoundly affected by illness, diagnosis, and recovery. 
So my prints and installations interrogate what it means to be dependent on a mechanical device for survival, to inhabit a cyborg-like existence as part human, part machine. This is the first artwork I made, thinking about my family um, and the genetics that I have and the DNA that I have from my family. Uh, this, was, this is a screen print, uh, an 11 layer screen print, which was meant to be given to family members as a pattern, um, a cross stitch pattern that they could make. So we suspect my genetic mutation is from my maternal side. This would be uh, for someone to make the cross stitch on my maternal side. This is an x-ray of my very first implanted defibrillator. It was a big deal at the time. Um, so you can see the ICD on the right and uh, quite possibly the lead that goes into the heart. So this is me thinking about being a cardiac arrest survivor and family. This is just a test piece. This is one of the first laser cuts I did and I'm just testing um, uh, speed and depth to go through different materials like paper versus fabric. You speed up, you speed up the laser, you increase the power and um, the fabric will burn or you can just, uh, just burn the surface and not cut through. This is another early work. So this is a Medtronic CareLink monitor. And it sends data from your ICD to the cardiology, cardiology department at the hospital. So when you have an implanted defibrillator, um, you're supposed to plug one of these in in your bedroom into a landline. And every night at 4 a.m., it sends um, information to the cardiology department. Um, so I decided to plant it in a pot um, with just a typical house plant that I could keep alive. And I left it in there for a year so that it could become completely root bound. Why? Uh, when you have an implanted defibrillator, scar tissue develops around the ICD and the leads, especially the leads. And you'll, you'll know this for any of you who have um, any kind of implanted technology. And the scar tissue is so tight that it sort of envelops the technology. So the leads from the ICD to the heart can't come out. They're in there forever. Um, if the leads ever cease to work, um, new leads are put in and they leave the old leads in because your body sort of takes over and won't release them and it's more dangerous to take them out. This is making, at the time this was, I was thinking about having a complete loss over the control of my body and I'm thinking about that, being root bound or trapped. Um, so a year later I pulled it out and it became the basis for um, a series of etchings. This is a photograph, um, so I'm just looking at it at different angles formally to uh, make an intaglio. But it, it can exist as a photograph as well. I also plugged it back in to send information to the cardiology department. Um, uh, there came a point in my life when it was important to find out which uh, genetic mutation that I, that I have. So there are 17 mutations in the genes that can cause long QT syndrome. Um, when I was a teenager, there were four to six. So every year, uh, geneticists are discovering new mutations. And with each, uh, with each mutated gene, there are different triggers that can cause cardiac arrest. So some people um, are triggered by emotional stress, some are physical exertion, some are startle, so your landline telephone ringing in the middle of the night, so thank, thank goodness we don't have landlines anymore. So this is like a petri dish or a blueprint, they're woodcuts on uh, mulberry paper, and I'm just looking at data and looking at long QT type 2, type 5, type 8, type 11, and I'm searching and wondering about what my genetic mutation is. 
So I sent a DNA sample and I'm waiting on the results. Process piece, these are the, the carved woodcuts. They're carved by a CNC router, so I'm using a machine to carve the work. Just like I rely on my ICD to keep me alive, I'm sort of lo letting myself lose a little bit of control and let, and let the machine do the work, it's out of my hands. And that's important. Uh, quite a few years ago, I visited a uh, Tranquil Sanatorium in Kamloops. Um, it's, a, 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 it's a town that was self-sustaining and took care of tuberculosis patients. Um, I went into the powerhouse that powered the entire town and hospital, school, houses, everything, farm, and the, pa the powerhouse um, recording charts were left behind. So this is the original spool and 365 charts. The charts are on a 24-hour period and the red line indicates power. Um, and so I screen printed onto each one of them it, it, and it sort of looks like a blueprint. Um, I'm thinking about cycles of life, life and death, um, birth and decay. The idea of the powerhouse is important for me, and I'm thinking about human and machine, almost like a Fritz Kahn thing. Um, I then sewed all of the surgical or all of the circular charts in, into cone shapes to install on the wall. Uh, materials I also brought for installation are electrodes, disposable electrodes, hospital gowns, hospital gown seams. Uh, some rubber bands, and my 365 screen printing charts. Um, on the left, you can see a little couple of little blips in, uh, in the recordings. The reason for this was I had a show scheduled at the Alberta Printmaker Society, and the day I was scheduled to install was also the day we were going to the children's hospital to find out if our to find out which genetic mutation um, my three month old could have, depending on which one I had. So we went in and a genetic counselor sat us down and said, We can't figure out which mutation you have, Marty, so we can't test your son. Um, so we can bring him in for uh, stress tests every year, but we can't genetically find out which mutation he has. We'll keep your DNA on file and every year as new mutations um, are discovered, maybe we'll be able to match that up with you. So we were afraid. And so my partner and I left that meeting and went to the Alberta Printmaker Society to install the show. We installed the back piece together, um, moving through Surprise, anger, shock, grief, um, being afraid, not wanting to be one of those parents who um, monitored their children all night for, uh, for a heartbeat and breathing rate. Um, so it was sort of an important process for us and for us to make that together. And working through receiving a false negative genetic test. This is a performance piece I did um, uh, during an artist talk. Um, this is my uh, this is my portable defibrillator, and I um, I defibrillated a trout that I picked up at the store. Um, this was in the fall, and uh, after living in Kamloops for a couple of years and being an avid fisherman. Um, I'm sure many of you have attended the fall salmon run. Um, so there's something called en route mortality, and that is X number of fish who don't actually make it back to the spawning site. Um, and I was thinking about thinking about motherhood and thinking about um, when I was diagnosed with long QT syndrome in the 90s. Uh, they were. They said, "You're really lucky to be alive. You're really lucky to not have 
extensive brain damage and you probably shouldn't have children. So I spent 20 years thinking I couldn't have children um, and feeling this connection with um, this idea of en route mortality, not making it, not, not making it to um, your destination, whatever that may be. Um, the defibrillation was unsuccessful. Uh, show, show a photograph embedded in there. This brings us to the work that I'm currently doing. Um, I was gifted this uh, medical textbook from 1927, and in it were about eight um, medical flap anatomies, so like a, a flip, flip pages um, and a layering of the body. This is Frank Scholl's Library of Health Complete Guide. This is um, not an original edition, but a later edition, and all of the flap anatomy in it are lithographs. This is the first time I encountered pay, uh, and became really interested in this kind of paper engineering. Um, this textbook um, opened medical diagnosis symptoms uh, solutions to broader economies of circulation. <clears throat> and it, I started to think about the history of the book as a performative object. Um, and anatomical performance, and thinking about how I could incorporate old and new technology, um, and analog and digital technology, and move through analog, digital, analog. This made me think of an, analog, um, an anatomical artist being a playwright, where there's a performance and the viewer partakes in that. I'm thinking, I'm also thinking about containment, um, and we'll get to that later. So this text, in the introduction, um, Frank Scholl says that this book is to be placed in homes, and it's for the wife and for the mother to take care of the family. So within this text, uh, this is the first flap anatomy that I will show you. This is mine, sort of been in the studio for a while and is a little bit of rough shape. Um, there are about five layers and um, you've probably all seen this image, it's sort of iconic and in pop culture now. So it's over a hundred years old um, and anyone can use it. So this is an example of uh, phrenology. Um, phrenology was used to predict mental traits by measuring bumps in, in one's head. It was basically the science of racism and sexism. And I was thinking about that. So I recreated the piece. This is a GIF that's not working for me in the way that I'm presenting it, but this is what the front cover looked like, and then the phrenology, and then muscles, bones, that sort of thing. Picture of good health. So my piece is approximately five by five. Uh, it was CNC, it was routed on a, on, on a CNC machine. It's three quarter inch ply and I, I recreated it and then I took an analog hand router to it um, and sort of destroyed it. And I think the process of, I think it was important to go through the process of destroying it and breaking it down and eroding it and thinking about, I'm thinking about making something new. Um, I think that this is still important today, these notions. I'm going to show you a couple of uh, woodcut prints made um, and they were inspired by some of the anatomy found in the Library of Health um, medical book. These prints are 22 by 30. Uh, they're CNC routed woodcuts and basically interested in 
uh, formal aspects of color, shape, and um, trying to achieve some transparency in my inks. I'm interested in the topographical feel they have. This one has a lot of embossing um, in the negative space, which is interesting. So they're formal exercises, they're bleed prints, so I'm trying to make them as big as I can. Um, I decided that I needed um, to do something more than um, print onto paper. So I decided to forego the paper and make a large scale piece that was uh, a wood, uh, what a, a painted woodcut. So here's uh, a look at the back plate, and this is based on one of the lithographs, one of the flap anatomy lithos in the Library of Health, um, and the lithos were all created by E. J. Stanley. This is an interesting to be reinterpreting. Um, a print from an old, another printmaker. Despite being pretty anonymous in those textbooks. Here's the work installed on the wall. So the back plate is, I think, seven by eight feet, and the flaps are um, removable, and there are ten organs that uh, the viewer can interact with in the gallery. Here's, here's um, two install images. The difference between paper and wood, so why wood? Um, I could have been a fourth generation logger, but I became an artist instead. Um, so perhaps using the three quarter inch ply might be sort of a, an homage to my great-grandfather. Um, what, I, what I find interesting about the work is, it's, is the scale, but the physical weight when you are looking at it is really necessary for me. And um, the metal, metal rods, which act as surgical rods, um, are, are, all of the work is sort of tight, tightly bound. Um, they don't slide off really easily. So you really physically have to pull to uh, remove and rearrange the organs. Um, so the viewer can deconstitute and reconstitute the work. It becomes a performative object, um, much like early flap anatomy. Um, the viewer can implant, extract, rearrange, um, and the organs, or the organisms become a readable terrain. Um, so flipping a flap or moving an organ is like repeating an autopsy or a dissection. These are details of some of the organs, the great omentum. Are they prints? Are they paintings? Are they carvings? Are they sculpture? Is it performance? Ah, so how do I make these pieces? Um, the imagery is hand-drawn, scanned, uploaded into the CNC software. The software translates it into an image like this. Um, the blue is the carve path and the red is the tool path. And I think that they would make lovely embroideries. This is the machine I use at Red Deer College. It's a techno CNC router um, and it is housed in the Center for Innovation and Manufacturing on campus and it carves four by eight foot. Uh, scale. It's actually really hard to ca carve uh, three-quarter inch plywood, especially when you're using cheap spruce plywood, it's warped, inevitably warped. So I have a lot of fails where it carves too shallow or way too deep. 
um, and I have tons of failed projects. Here's a quick tip. So I like to draw um, or paint or do research while my robot carves. Um, I started researching early modern flap anatomy medical illustrations from the 15th to 18th century. Uh, the book I was looking at was relatively new quite new, really, 19, 1927. Um, so this is uh, an example of flap anatomy from 1576. Um, cosmological concepts of the body were being gradually replaced by notions of the body as an object of modern medicine and science. Um, the process of anatomical inquiry created anatomical objects using techniques such as dissections, injections, wet and dry specimens, draw drawings and prints. Um, there were also many discussions and published books. So I'm interested in how they established these new objects of knowledge. This brings me to Andreas Vesalius. Um, this is Andreas Vesalius's Fabrica, Fabric of the Body. The printer was Johann Operinus. Um, these are all woodcuts, and this is from 1535. This was a publishing sensation. Vesalius meant it to be a sensation. Um, there were many before him, but he wanted to be the, be the one and only and the best. Um, he did this by printing on high quality paper. The typography was beautiful. The woodcuts were of very, very high quality. And he openly dedicated the book to Emperor Maximilian V. This is the front, front piece and it's iconic and many people have um, studied it. It's a public dissection. It has a vibrant and diverse crowd. Uh, it's a richly decorated anatomical theater. It, it, again, it's sensational. There's a female cadaver in the front, and beside the cadaver is Vesalius. And this is the key here. He um, wants everyone to know that he has a new identity that no one has ever had before, that he is all three, lecturer, demonstrator, and dissector of the cadaver. So he's the new number one. Um, so he is trying to, he published this um, to rewrite anatomy. Um, until, so until the end of the 17th century, the icon, iconography of anatomy uh, legitimized the dissection of the body and, and portrayed the anatomist as honorable, dignified, and a decent scholar. Um, and there were about 400 years of public dissections. So Vesalius isn't well known for having, for flap anatomy, um, mostly just uh, one page woodcut prints that are, that are quite, quite stunning, but this is an example of one of Vesalius's flap anatomy pieces, and they're all hand painted, um, and depending on which text you look at, um, the painting is different. One that I find really interesting is Johann Remlin, uh, who was a doctor. The artist, um, which is important to printmakers, is Lucas Killian. This is uh, from 1613, and it's uh, from Mirrors of the Microcosm. It's an engraving. Uh, some of the interior pieces are etched. Um, what is really interesting about this piece is um, it, 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 the flap anatomy isn't the traditional flip up. It replicates uh, what a dissection would be where your um, it opens up horizontally. 
like your, uh, the ribs are opening and you're seeing the organs inside. So it's uh, pretty fabulous. So the observer or the manipulator of the book um, could imagine that they're performing the dissection. And what's interesting is that within the organs are loose bits that you can take out and study. Uh, you'll also know that, the, see that the female um, is covered with a plume of cloud. Private parts. This is the, <laughs> this is the first and smallest flap anatomy piece I looked at. So this is René Descartes, 1664, um, from his De Homine, and this is the pineal gland. So it's just a tiny, tiny little flap. And I'm also interested in um, adhesive techniques, so I've included the, uh, the backside of the paper for um, all of you printmaking nerds who love to see this. And the piece is just ever so slightly, um, so there's a hole cut through the paper, and the flap is ever so slightly folded over and adhered. And hundreds of years later, it's still completely intact. So, uh, as you may know, Descartes thought that the pineal gland was, the, was where your soul was located and all of your thoughts. <laughs> I, I included this newer piece. It's from 1895. It's Russian. I could show you flap anatomy all day. Um, what's interesting about it is, well, the, the look on his face. But um, I'm interested in, uh, that's a litho, so I'm int really interested in the color palette. And the way, and the way that um, the artist has um, decided that, uh, the way that the artist has decided that the pieces will fold out, flip up. They be can become quite complicated. So after researching me uh, many many, many uh, pieces of flap anatomy from all over. Um, this was uh, a piece I made in response to that. I was still really interested in looking at Vesalius, uh, and I was inter I'm interested in representations of gender, specifically from that time. This is a torso. Um, you can see some of the ribs, you can see the stomach, and some of the small intestine. So I'm looking for scale. This is CNC routed. Um, I don't use the CNC router to cut them out. I cut them out by hand, so I need that. I need that connection to the piece to finish it off like that, and to hand hand uh, sand the edges. There it is in the studio. This work hasn't been shown. It was more of a test piece. Um, and after making the test, I made this piece. So the, it's CNC routed but it, and cut out, but it hasn't been painted yet. Here it is painted and installed. Uh, I have called this Fabrica, female torso of a hanged woman. This is also inspired by an illustration in Vesalius' text. The cadaver of a woman would have been um, the cadaver would have been someone from out of town or someone from a very low socioeconomic background. This image is three by seven feet, um, and it is made to be monumental or a monument to this anonymous woman. Um, cadavers, Vesalius sourced cadavers. Um, from public hangings, and he had enough clout to um, ask that a hanging be scheduled at a certain time so that he could follow up with a dissection with his students. Uh, students were also sent out to rob graves to source cadavers. She would have been hung as a, uh, as a criminal with a criminal charge, um, and then instead of being buried, um, sh she didn't really have a choice in the matter and was dissected. because of her social status. This is uh, an illustration I wanted to show you in uh, Vesalius's Fabrica. Uh, it's been looked at quite a few times by artists. 
This is Vesalius' depiction of a vagina. My response to that is this piece. It is approximately 9 by 10 feet installed, and I call it hung XXXY XYZ. It's a painted woodcut that attempts to dissect early modern social constructions of gender and sexuality. Um, this is based on uh, Vesalius' cadaver of, a, of the hanged woman that we just looked at. She's shown repeatedly in the text, um, and this is his depiction of her vagina. He describes the vaginal canal as an inverted penis. So we can look at this in two, one of two, or we can look at this in two ways. We can look at this as an inferior version of male genitalia, or we can look at it um, as a variation of a single gender, which is something that is, an, which is an interesting idea. So inside or outside single gender, which I think is nice. I've also paired it with 100 speculums. So the modern day vaginal speculum um, is designed completely after um, uh, quite a controversial 19th century uh, person named James Marion Sims. He kept slave women for um, gynecological experiments. Uh, anesthetic had already been invented um, and he wasn't using it and um, they weren't condoning this. Um, so this is sort of an important piece to me. They didn't have a choice in the matter. This is another example of um, the software for the CNC router creating a, a tool path and a carve path. This is an early example you see repeatedly across um, anatomists, doctors, barber surgeons, illustrators of the eye. They often copied each other all the way up until that Vesalius and then many others copied Vesalius. This is my piece. Um, I've made it specifically a certain size for an exhibition. It's four feet high. This is uh, an example of it un unpainted. Here's a close-up of the texture that can be achieved with a CNC router. And I'm really interested in the topographical feel and the revealing of those layers of that cheap spruce plywood. I have no interest in using a hardwood or anything better. It does chip sometimes. Certain sides don't work. You have to look at the layers the layers of the veneer and determine which side and how deep you're going to go and whether or not it will chip and sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Here's another view. There's a little bit of shredding in some pieces and that's fine. Um, this is an image that shows up repeatedly in flap anatomy and anyone who researches flap anatomy likes to call this one the scream. Uh, this is from uh, uh, inspired by a Witowski um, scream. It's often depicted as uh, with, with female anatomy but it all, can also have a mustache. Um, this one I don't have a painted image of it but um, this piece has a mustache and lipstick on and um, I feel like this right now, in the past couple of months. It's only, again, it's only, it's four feet high. It's a little bit more portable and can fit in a, in a lot more gathering spaces. This is another uh, flap anatomy piece. It's a woodcut by Heinrich Wagther. It's German and it's from 1539. This is a fugitive sheet. So a fugitive sheet, or a broadside, means it's a loose sheet. It wasn't in any book or text, 
It was mass produced and handed out as a sheet. Often um, you can find uh, the back sheet and then a page with uh, a page that's been printed with all of the pieces to be cut out by the receiver of the paper and you cut it out yourself, you glue it and assemble it yourself, and you hand paint it yourself. So they weren't often sent out assembled. You had to assemble them yourself. So this is a nice example of a, well, this is the fugitive sheet I saw. This one has a tear in it, which is okay. There's been some conservation done to it. So things that are interesting to me, the long V-shaped tube is called the lacmamil, which was said to turn blood into milk for nursing mothers. Uh, what's really interesting about all of these um, pieces of ephemera are that um, you can see the stain on the right hand side and the, st the red stain is right where you would lift the flap and it's sort of a red color. So it's been used and someone's had dirty fingers while they've lifted it and or um, that was added, someone painted that on. These were distributed to a really wide audience from scholars to students to the general public. The general public weren't always familiar with Latin, but they could flip through the organs and, and understand. Wormholes. So I'm um, also finding changes that have been made over time via wormholes, um, bends and folds, fingerprints, uh, the addition of hand painted items, or whether it was hardly touched. So the amount of use is really interesting to me as well. So this particular piece, this particular um, piece of flap anatomy inspired a print. So I was researching all of these, I was doing research intending to make painted woodcuts. Um, last May I was in North Carolina at Duke University researching um, early modern flap anatomy. I was looking at this piece while well, one of the faculty assisting me came over and told me that the governor had just signed House Bill 314, which, was an, which is an anti-abortion bill. And, I, and for the rest of the day, I heard women um, all over campus discussing the thought of losing their bodily autonomy. Um, and we had this shared feeling of shock, fear, and tension. You could tell there was tension in the air amongst um, people who are concerned with reproductive rights. And it was, it was pretty surreal. Um, and as you know, it prompted protests, if we can remember to last, back to last year, pre-COVID times. Luckily, in October, a federal judge blocked the ban that would have gone into effect um, in November. Um, and it blocked Ohio, Missouri, Kentucky, Mississippi, and Georgia. But um, before the federal judge blocked it, um, I made this, came home and made this print. And I think it might be even more important than my woodcuts, or definitely accompany to my work in an interesting way. So this is a 22 by 30 inch etching, um, and it has multiple flaps. It started off as my own drawing, inspired by um, the former image that you saw. So they're hand drawn. Um, all of the image is hand drawn and is put into the CNC software and then carved. But what I did with this piece is I allowed the machine to recarve the image over and over and over, and I also moved the plate as it was carving. So there's a sense of chaos, fragmentation, distortion, um, all embedded within, within the piece, which really reflects my feelings and emotions at the time. I wouldn't recommend moving the plate around when you're using a CNC router um, without having a lot of training. Um, here's an image of the router um, carving, carving and etching.
So it is very precise. It can be very precise. Um, it's it's quick, uh, and it just takes a while to set the depth. Uh, the machine is quiet to run, so it's sort of a nice nice thing to watch, unlike the really loud woodcuts. So I'll go back to the piece for a moment. It's a self-portrait. Uh, this is just a process shot of, of an edition I was working on that was based on the larger print. I'm hand tinting all of the pieces with watercolor. This is an image of cutting out all of the organs. And assembling. Parenting and assembling at the same time. Uh, here's a close-up of the organs I've inserted. Once it's glued, I'm using rice paste to glue it down, and so far they've been very secure, and they're not coming off. I'll see if I can show you a video. Uh, this is, um, I had an exhibition in Ontario, and animator Sarah Wild um, made a sort of a, a lovely little gif of my work for me. Okay, so with these uh, with these fugitive sheets or broadsides, uh, the male and the female would have sort of different organs surrounding them. And from the top left and across, uh, the organs were ordered um, in importance. And it was thought, earlier on, it was thought that if you, the male observer of the flap anatomy, could gain control over the most important organs, if you could learn how to control them, you would have control of your own body, and therefore you would um, have control of your life and be a better student, etc., etc. Um, it is of note that often the very first um, female organ that would be, to be, be depicted is an oversized spleen, and um, uh, you were to um, they were thinking about black bile coming out of this out of this spleen and being attributed to the woman or a woman. Um, so I've my piece has I've I've added uh, in the bottom left I added I rem uh, added an organ or an object and it is a coat hanger. Um, again thinking about uh, bodily autonomy and uh, having having rights it's just another image of the piece again so I've lost due to COVID I've sort of don't really have access to the studio, so I've purchased a small tabletop um, do-it-yourself router that I am in the process of getting going so that I can work from home. Um, and then this room is my studio, so we'll see how that works out. Here is an image of uh, carving plexiglass. Um, so I'm working on incorporating layers of colored plexi into my um, painted woodcuts, and I'm continuing with a series of CNC routered etchings that will have flap anatomy layers. 
And that's where I'm at. Uh, I have a couple of books that I would like to recommend if you're interested in um, any of the topics I was talking about. So these are my three favorites. Catherine Park's Secrets of Win Women, Gender, Generation, and the Origins of Human Dissection is an excellent book. 500 Years of Women's Work, the Lisa Unger Baskin Collection. So I was fortunate enough to see this, uh, a portion of the collection in an exhibition that depicted a lot of historical uh, prints and books. So that is a really fabulous text. This is Suzanne Carr Schmidt's Altered and Adorned Using Renaissance Prints in Daily Life. She works at the Newbury Library um, and it's a fabulous uh, book as well if you're interested in the history of anatomy and print. And I will end it with that. I hope everyone has a fabulous uh, Alberta Culture Days and gets a chance to uh, watch artist talks and perhaps go to a few galleries um, this month. Thanks everyone. Bye!